So normally on a Sunday morning, uh, at this time, we would invite our fifth grade and younger children to make their way to children's church. But we think that there should be times throughout the year when folks who volunteer so faithfully and selflessly in our children's ministry have opportunities to sit the entire service with their families. And the entire, uh, not just for the, the kids to get to see what worship looks like normally when we, after we've left the room, but for the moms and dads who commit so much of their time to serving your children. Some of you are volunteers in our children's ministry. We are grateful, grateful for you. And, and many others benefit from the, the willingness of folks to go and to love and serve your children so that you can stay through the whole service. And so a handful of times a year, we, we say, why don't we just all stay? Let's all stay together. But I'm, I'm feeling a little bit of pressure because when there's children in the room, um, it feels like, well, Brent's gonna have to be funnier and he's gonna have to have more energy and he's got to be a little louder so that the, the volume of the kids and the energy of the kids doesn't uh, distract folks. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna do this just real quick and all y'all are gonna do it with me. It's gonna be something we all do together, okay? So in children's ministry, um, they, they leave normally, they leave here and they go into the hall and they get their grade level and then they go into the gym or the classroom and generally speaking, there is an activity that goes with the lesson. And so we're gonna have an activity right now. Does everybody stand up? Have a fun activity. This is gonna be great. Most of y'all are gonna think it's really great even when it's over and some of you are gonna be like, it's really great because it's over. <laughs> Here's what we're gonna do. Ever play Simon Says before? All right, here we go. You know the rules then. I don't have to spend a lot of time on these. Simon, when I say Simon Says, you do what Simon Says. If I don't say Simon Says, you don't do. You Follow? All right, so if, if you've never played this game before, um, you'll catch on to the people around you. So it goes simply like this. Simon says, put your hand in the air. See, y'all, most of y'all already have it figured out. You can put it down now. And if you did, you can sit down too. So um, now here's what I figure out early on. This is what I figure out early on. Uh, it's been a long time since Mandy has played Simon Says. But Mandy, from where I sit, you're not alone. You just, you just, you're not alone. And some of you are like, come on, Parker. My shoulder's about to give out. All right, Simon Says, you can put your hand down. Now, this is the moment where I say there are people in the room who like to lose at games so they don't have to play the game anymore. And some of y'all, let me just give you, a, give you a quick out. If you don't want to play the game, Simon Says, sit down. Simon said, sit down. If you're still standing, you're out. <laughs> and now Simon says, stand back up. <laughs> Except for the folks who are out. Hey, Simon says, pat yourself on the head. Night, nice. Simon says, pat your neighbor's head. Okay, stop. Uh, and if you did, go ahead and sit down. All right, Simon says stop. Simon says stop. When's Simon gonna say stop? You know, I'm just gonna say this real quick. At this point in the game, at the nine o'clock service, there were only about eight people left. <laughs> You're a much smarter crowd than they are. Simon says you can all be seated. So, so this is the thing that's interesting to me. Um, hey, Josh, did you get something for everybody? <laughs> So, um, so here's the thing. Who is Simon? And since when did we let him tell us what to do? I, I never figured out when I was a kid why we had to play Simon Says and it couldn't just be whoever the leader is, right? Kind of to Mandy's point. I do what my boss tells me to do on the first time, right? She doesn't need Simon. She just needs some authority. Here's the thing. All week long as we're reading through this Exodus thing, the question why is the question that keeps stirring in me. Some of you showed up today and you're gonna be like, all right, we don't know what they're talking about. This is our first week there. Let me just catch you up. We've been, we're working through the book of Exodus. There's 40 chapters. We're not gonna do a chapter a week as we've done with other books of the Bible, but we're gonna push through this thing through the end of November but because we want you to know the story of Exodus because it's not just a story we read on pages. It's not a story that someone's gonna try to prove really happened or not. It's a story that your, pra your pastor, your preacher says happened. And it's not their story, it's our story. And had this story not happened, your story would not be happening. It's important for us to 
sit back in this story and acknowledge it's ours. It took this to get us here. And that's the way I preach it. This is the way I teach it because I think it's true. So why? Like, like why do we do what we do? Why? There's a lot of why questions. Your kids probably have a lot of them. And normally when your kid asks why, you respond, because I said so. Or why, mom and dad? It's just the way it is, right? We're, we're sometimes impatient with that question of why. But here's the thing I'm starting to realize, and if you were here a few weeks ago when we kicked off Exodus, maybe you'll remember this, that what I was trying to say in the message out of Exodus chapter one and two is not only that God is for life, and that's what we talked about, that Moses was born in a culture that said kill all the baby boys. They refused to do that, and his life mattered, and all life does. But even more so a few weeks ago when I was in that message was this encouragement, this invitation, this this nudging to try to help all of us, no matter if it's on a topic of life or any other topic that our political pundits put before us to divide us, that the goal is to become curious about the other, not condemning of the other. The question why, like why do you believe what you believe about that topic? Why do you feel so passionately about this thing that we're gonna be voting on? that the why question would lead towards curiosity instead of just a, an immediate dehumanization of the other. That what we don't know should lead us into inquisitiveness, not into quitting and putting up a wall. And we kind of went there in the first week and, and I appreciated y'all's willingness to sit and to listen in on that. And, he, and even since then, to, to let me know how much that meant to you and that it really is starting to shift the way you think about the way you're gonna approach the next several months in our country's uh, future together. So let me just catch us all up in Exodus. We have, we have Moses is born. Moses is, could come across as like the central figure of this story. We know God is. But God's gonna move through this Exodus and he's gonna take Moses as the leader. Now, you'll remember Moses was like, I don't think I'm the guy to lead. And God gets a little bit frustrated with that. He says, look, I don't know how to talk right, God. And God says, who gave you your mouth? Don't you think I can make you have the words that are needed and give you the ability to speak them? He goes, but he still complained. He said, I don't wanna do it, ultimately. He just said, I don't wanna do it. To which God said, well, you have big brother Aaron. He's a few years older than you, and I'll send him to go with you. In fact, he's already on his way, and y'all can go together. And what we'll do is I'll tell you, Moses, what to say, and then you tell Aaron, and then Aaron will tell Pharaoh, because ultimately, here's what I'm doing. I'm sending you to my people who have become slaves in Egypt. It's not like the old days where Joseph, one of my people, came to Egypt to, to make a way when Joseph's brothers threw him in that little ditch or that, that hole and ultimately sold him into slavery, what they meant for harm, God worked out for good. Joseph made that goodness available during the famine time, you may recall. Joseph has now died, though, and his bones are in a box, and they're supposed to take these bones with them wherever they go forward. Don't forget your story. Take it forward with you. And where we are in the story now is that, that Moses and Aaron have gone to Pharaoh and said, hey, let, let God's people go. And they said, well, who's this God? Well, it's I am. His name is I am, or I will be what I will be. This is the God that was the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. The Israelites start to get on board a little bit. Okay, we've heard of this God. We know this God. We've read of this God, heard of this God. He's faithful and he's true. What's going on though is that Pharaoh's gonna lose a lot of economy in this deal because he's got all of these Israelites as slaves working for him. And they go and they say, set the people free so we can go out in the wilderness and worship. This is what the Lord is calling us into freedom to worship. Sidebar, last week, if you were here, you may recall this line I was trying to draw between the quality of our worship and the depth of our faith. You Filled with faith, you worship wholeheartedly. Even if your hands aren't in the air and they're in your pockets instead, you can wholeheartedly worship even in a non-physical way, but your worship will rise to the level of your faith. That's what we talked about last week. So, so what's happened since then is uh, Moses and, and Aaron have, have gone back to the Pharaoh and, and said, Pharaoh, let them go. And Pharaoh goes, nope, not gonna do it. And so, he's, so the Lord starts sending plagues. And today would have been a really fun day to just go through all the plagues together and describe them. I think the middle schoolers especially would love that. Um, 
But if you flip, like we were in chapters uh, four through eight last week, and if you go into like chapters eight and nine and 10, you'll see this for yourself if you go and read. Um, there was the plague of the blood. There was the plague of the frogs. There was the plague of the gnats. I can't stand gnats. Um, there was the plague on the, of flies. Man, I can't stand flies. And those things you buy at Home Depot and they, like the traps, only three days later, it smells like all, it's, it's horrible. There's gotta be a better way to get rid of flies. Then there's the livestock. Then there's the boils. Oh, that would have been fun. Then there was hail that was fallen, and then locust came, and then there was a plague of darkness for three whole days. And here's what goes on. There's one more plague after that that we're gonna deal with here in a second. But after every plague that was intended to, to let the Pharaoh know how powerful our God is and to encourage him to let his people go, he would at once go, all right, y'all get out of here. I'm convinced your God is God, and you need to get out of here, take the boils and the gnats and the frogs and all the stuff with you. And as soon as the plague would end, every single time, the Pharaoh would change his mind or his heart would get hardened again. And there's something in there for us. Like when troubles come, we rely on the Lord, we're all in on the Lord, and then the Lord comes and meets our need and fulfills his promises to us, and then we go right back to doing our own things until we need him again. And this is kind of how the Pharaoh's doing it. So we can't always be the hero in the story. Sometimes we're like Pharaoh. So this week we moved on, and we're in chapters 11 through 13, and there's the, the plague of the firstborn, the Passover, which is what we celebrate next Sunday in our, in our uh, communion time. And then eventually the people get to go, and it's gonna take children dying, it's gonna take an angel of death, it's gonna take blood of the lamb on a doorpost. But all throughout this section that we're in this week, was this recurring remark, this recurring statement. And when your children ask you, what does this mean? Have something to tell them. When your children ask you, what does this mean? Have something to tell them. That was in chapter 12, you get to 13, and it says, on that day, tell your son, I do this because of what the Lord did for me when I came out of Egypt. And just a few verses later again, it comes. In days to come, when your son asks you, what does this mean? Say to him, with a mighty hand, the Lord brought us out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. Our stories matter. The truth matters. Now, I learned this kind of early on. So when I was in college, you know I like college sports. And so uh, my first degree is from the University of Houston. I remember showing up there. And I went to my first game because we didn't have the thing that the Aggies do where you teach all this stuff in advance. We just have to find out why you get there. Whose house? Coog's house. We learned it while we actually we invented that while we were there. But there was a hand sign just like this. Go Cougs. Now, if you went to Arizona State, this is like uh, poke them devils or something like that. But it's the same hand sign. Well, when you look at it from a distance, it looks like a U and an H. And a lot of people think that that's why we were doing it. U-H, U-H. And a lot of people do this in the stands. They have no clue why they're doing it. No clue at all. But when I was going to school there and I was in charge of the frontiersmen, which was like the group of guys who run the flags on the field, they wear those long brown coats, they usually have a little skull in their lip. Um, we learned, because if we didn't know this stuff, we were gonna get hazed, that there's a, another story, the true story. 1953, University of Houston and its live Cougar, Shasta won. We were headed to UT to play a game against the Texas Longhorns. Their sign is like this. Sorry, uh, just out of habit. <laughs> and, and apparently what happened on that trip was our Cougar, who was in a cage, the cage got shut on the Cougar's paw and it took one of his fingers. So those Longhorns, the very dignified folks that they are, they were doing this the whole game. Word got out. They started like chanting against us, making fun of our cougar, right? Like that's not nice. But there's a story behind all of these things. In fact, just in a way of practicing this, you know, you Aggies, I give y'all a hard time. Sometimes I do, but I love the Aggie people. I do. And so I was trying to learn a little bit more about the Aggies this week, this tradition thing, because if you say tradition, you're talking about the Aggies. But why? 
like the century tree and I can't walk on the grass and how come I have to be a sophomore before I can repeat A instead of just saying A in a long way, right? At what point do I get the rest of the vowels? But I, I wanted to go and read the traditions. I learned one this past week. Your thumb, gig them, right? It's something that you learned at, at uh, the fish camp thing. You learned all the stuff. You may or may not know this. If you're not an Aggie or if you skipped out on fish camp, you may not realize this, that that comes from 1930, even older. In 1930, one of your Board of Regents guys, whose name I can't remember, it's a funny name, interesting name, he got up in front of the student body and said, this Saturday, we play Texas Christian University. What are we gonna do to those frogs? Gig them. I'm trying to like y'all. I really am. <laughs> trying to like y'all, but you know I'm a horn frog. Gig them. And now Aggies have been doing it ever since, right? Now, the truth is we won that game, so they didn't gig us very well. But, <laughs> but the Aggies have beat us the last 23 times we faced each other. So um, the streak is still going because we're in different conferences. But the why is important. Why we do what we do. And as I'm reading through this Exodus story, I keep finding these stops and, and the Lord saying, when your son asks, be ready to tell him why. When people say, why are we doing this? Be prepared to tell them why. At the end of this story, there, there's gonna be a moment where there'll be a pile of rocks on the other side of the, the Jordan River when they finally get to the promised land. And, and, and in that moment, they're gonna say, Joshua's gonna say, go get those rocks and pile them up over here so that when in future generations people come and say, what do these mean? You are prepared with an answer. So on Sunday mornings, I work hard to put a sermon together to, to try to impress you with my knowledge and impress you with my oratory skills and try not to offend you too much, just step on the toes lightly enough just enough. Uh, but I, I commented on this this past week. If you were here, maybe you'll recall that there's, there's this growing awareness in me of, Parker, you can't take these people where you want them to go. Only I can. And you can want it for them all day long, but you gotta remember, I want it more. You can love these people in my direction, as hard as you can, but at the end of the day, I love them more, I love them first, and I'm the only one who can guide them. And I'm starting to wonder if the whole format of church, of, of an audience coming into a room to watch the actors and the singers, if, if, if that's useful to a point, but if there's more that will be required of our time together for the Lord to say to you what he's been trying to say to you and to do in you, through you, for you, the things that only he can do. And it's led me back to this question of why. All week long, I thought, I wonder why they come to church. I wonder why they come to our church. Again, this isn't judgmental at all. This is curiosity. I wonder why they come to our church when there's other really great churches not very far away. I wonder why they go to church at all. Like, why do they wake up in the morning and fight with kids to get them into a car, fight in the car on the way to fight then for a parking spot? A lot of fighting involved. We just stay out of the fight and stay home. What is it that encourages them to go through all that trouble, all that hassle? And then when they come in the room, when we come into the room, why do we worship? These are the questions that I was sort of stirring this, this week. And to be quite honest, I, I said to the Lord, if I ask why, what if they say, I don't know, and they just stop doing all, like they stop coming and they stop worshiping and they stop believing because they haven't really thought about why they do it. But the Lord's encouraged me to lean in a little bit and to ask the question, to pose the question. At first, a bit hypothetically, to give you a moment to kind of process why do I 
why do I? Why do I come here on a Sunday morning? Why do I sing these songs? Why do I listen to these sermons sometimes? Why do I pray? And then I thought, you know what? I I can't let you off the hook with it just being a hypothetical. And now I know there's gonna be people in the room, we're about to do something, and you're all getting anxious. It's fine. Perfect love cast out all fear. Just know I love you, and I wouldn't ask you to do something that's gonna be hard, or painful at least. But I want you to, in just a moment, I'm giving you a 30-second buy-in and and sort of on-ramp here. I want you to think about your why. I want you to think about why. Why do I worship? Why do I follow the Lord? Why do I love him? Why am I here? And then I want you to take, we're gonna give you a handful of moments. It's easier sometimes to answer those questions in front of people who you already know and love. And so I'm gonna give you that ability. And if you came by yourself, I wanna invite you to take a courageous step and ask the person beside you to go first to buy you a little bit more time to answer. But I wanna give us, I wanna give us a handful of minutes and, and um, what you're gonna do is you're just gonna turn to, to your neighbor and answer the question, this is why I believe. This is why I believe. You ready? Okay, I'm really doing this. Okay, take a couple moments. Why do I believe? Spend about 30 more seconds and then pass to the person across from you or to the next person beside you. Take one more minute and finish. Okay, for the sake of the introverts in the room who are like, is this over yet? Um, I'm gonna assume that what you're in the middle of saying, for those of you who are still speaking, is something you can hit just a quick timeout on and maybe pick it up um, over lunch or pick it up uh, just as service is over. Feel free to stick around in here to continue the conversation. Here's what I'm learning. 
I'm learning that faith is both given and faith is received. I was asking some folks around the church this morning the, the question, kind of just on the spot, why do you believe? And uh, I got one response was, because it's true. I believe because it's true. And then they couldn't help but go further and talk to me about the truth of the love of God as they've experienced the love of God in their life. Another person I asked, why do you believe? And it took a moment, but then they responded, because my mom believed. And this is what I'm starting to realize is that um, in many ways, the faith that I have got its start and took its root because my mom and dad believe. And their moms and dads believed. There is something about the generational passing down of the faith that gets us started. But I can no longer live the faith of my mom and dad. It impacts my faith, it encourages my faith, it nurtures my faith, but I need my own. You know, in the Bible it talks about be prepared in season, out of season to give defense of the hope that is in you. If the hope of God is in you, be ready at all times to share the hope that is in you with another person. You see, this is how the gospel makes its way. This is how the story of Exodus made its way to Wood Forest. On the opposite side of the world, faith was passed down, received, grew. Then it was passed down and received and grew. It was passed down, received, and it grew. Some of you can track your faith back multiple generations. Others will, in generations from now, look back to the day you said yes to Jesus, and that will be the moment when they can look back to. It's probably not fair to ask you a question that I'm not willing to answer myself. Why do I believe? In part, because without God, I am lonely. Without God, I have no hope. I mean, I was raised in the life of the church. And I ran off to college and I started chasing all the things that my friends told me would fulfill me. And somehow with plenty of friends, male and female, with plenty of parties, with plenty of everything that my friends said would fulfill me, I found myself on my knees admitting to the Lord, all of this is not filling me. I remember when we were close, God. I want that back. I want it again. And he said, I never left. And on August 9th, 1998, I went back to the front of a church, Second Baptist Houston, and I said, God, I want you in my life again. I'm so lonely. And I'm just wondering if I'm not the only one in the room. It's been a long time since some of us have said, why do I believe? I know for sure there was a man in the first service who came over to me in tears and said, I, I needed the reminder today that God sees me. I'm not alone. I haven't disappointed him so much that he would turn away forever. And this is the story we're in with Exodus. God created these Israelites, has worked in their lives all the way, and now they're in slavery wondering, has he left us? And it reminds them by saying, nope, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob, the God of Joseph, that God is still your God and he's still with you. Fast forward numbers of generations and I can proclaim to you again today because it was proclaimed to me, you are not alone. The God of all of those figures in the scriptures and the God of Nyla and the God of Laura and the God of Denny is my God. And my God is now the God of Cademan and Kingston and Kai. And by the grace of God, if they are blessed with children, their children will know but they'll only know if the why I believe is shared. So that's the encouragement I want to offer you today. That when your son asks you, why did we do this? When your child asks, why do we do this? You're ready with a response. Better than it's just what we do. So that's what I want to pray. Take us back to the why of of why we're here. Let's pray together. God sells and marketing and leadership gurus, they all know this, that people buy the why. 
There's power in the why. The why question interacts with a part of our brain that interacts with our hearts. The what is helpful, the how is useful, but the why. The why is what sparks us. The why is what starts us. The the why is what fuels us. It's what gives depth. The why is the, the question that takes us back to the last moment we were with you, the last time we experienced you. Why takes us back to you. So thank you for creating space for us to think about the question why, for us to ask the question why, for us to answer the question why. And I pray, God, that that question will just linger in us even as we leave this place, that that maybe we need to keep answering it over lunch today. Or maybe maybe we need to call pastor and say, you know what, you asked me to, to think about why I believe and I had no answer. I could not come up with anything. God, it's a dangerous place to be to follow you and not know why. And so provide space for, to answer the why, the longing in the hearts of your people. God, thanks for being with us this morning, for spending time with us, drawing near to us, reminding us that you, you're with us, you see us, you hear us, you know us, and you love us. Well, that you like us. And you're proud of us. And you wouldn't want to live without us. So we thank you, God. Thank you, thank you. In Jesus' name.